I'm going to skip. I'm not going to read through this, but but these uh, that can let you. I'll ask you to read these uh, to yourself, uh, either now or later. But uh, observational studies have their limitations. They're a little bit weaker than uh, experimental studies. Um, uh, experimental studies allow us to control uh, factors that could otherwise account for relationships. Uh, if you think a uh, that uh, let's say there's a, just to name a, something off the uh, top of my head, that there's a, a, a gender difference, a sex difference in a certain disease. Uh, then you need to set up uh, two groups. Uh, but both group, one group gets the treatment, one group gets no treatment or gets a different treatment, uh, like exposed to wind turbines versus not exposed, for example. Uh, this is ludicrous to think that there is a difference in, in terms of wind turbines, in terms of sex or gender, but I'm just giving this as an exa example. But you have to make sure that there's an equal number of matched males and females in each group. So that's um, the idea of control. So the experiments allow you to do that, whereas some of these experiments, I mean, some of these observational studies do not. Uh, just some simple examples of uh, observational research. Uh, I can just observe a single case and report it in the literature. I can observe a series of cases. I can uh, look at the, what prevalence uh, is, what, what the prevalence is of a per particular disease. Uh, how often does it occur in a given population? Uh, I can compare uh, an at-risk group to a group that's not at risk. Usually these are kinds of studies that involve naturally occurring groups. I can't manipulate them in a laboratory. Uh, I can do a cohort study in which I, expose, in which I take an exposed group and follow that group longitudinally over a period of time, sometimes years. That's the kind of study that Nina Pierpont does, and Nina Pierpont has been lambasted because she did not do an experimental study. But it's a pretty good example of a, a credible observational or descriptive study that can turn out some pretty interesting results. Some, some experimental uh, studies might involve laboratory studies, uh, which are usually considered high science, high level of science, but uh, when we take people in laboratories, we take them out of their natural surroundings and things might be a little different in the laboratory, so they have their weak side as well. You can do crossover studies where you treat people, two groups, uh, different treatments, and then swap them, swap the treatments over time, and see if things reverse themselves. And that's been done, and is being done now with wind turbine research. Uh, and you do the higher level of uh, Clinical research is where you do controlled clinical trials, where you take people with similar characteristics and put them blindly in one group or another. You've all heard of the experimental stuff that NIH does, uh, cancer research, for example, doing experimental drug studies. Uh, one group gets the experimental drug, the other group gets a placebo. They don't know what they're doing. That's very hard to do with wind turbines because people know what group they're in. It's, it's, some of these studies are very hard to do with wind turbines. Okay. Uh, and it can't really be done in a laboratory. So that's, I think those are the reasons that we have no more research than we have. Uh, briefly, the, uh, I don't want to get too much detail here. My slides are a little bit long-winded, I'm afraid. Let me just kind of summarize the next few slides. Uh, sources of noise from wind turbines are basically two sources. One is called the nacelle, which is the gearbox. And that really doesn't present any serious problems these days because that can just be handled by regular routine maintenance procedures. Um, th that's been improved over time. The other is caused by blades, namely the blades that turn uh, in the wind and create turbulence of air, particularly as the blades pass the tower. If you could put the blades a mile away from the tower or let's say 500 feet from the tower, you'd have a lot less problem than you would with the, the way that these things are now being built. Uh, these uh, produce some audible sounds and they produce some inaudible sounds. We'll call the inaudible sounds the infrasonic sounds. Okay? The ones below human hearing capability. Um, turbulence, uh, I, I don't want to go through the details. I, again, I wanted to put it on the slide so you could take it home. Uh, there's a pretty detailed description of uh, turbulence or turbulent flow, which is a real source of uh, noise for the turbulence. Uh, one of these uh, problems uh, that is, one of the aspects of turbulent flow is that when you have uh, blades that aren't twisting uh, to take maximum advantage of the, wind, of the wind to extract the maximum amount of energy, you can get some turbulent uh, noise. Uh, and the more out of alignment they are, 
the more noise you're going to get. Um, wind shear is another problem. Uh, over short distances, the wind speed differs. So from the top of the blade <coughs> to the bottom of the blade, for example, or the top of one blade to the bottom of another, uh, if, the, if the wind uh, speed, uh, even direction, varies over that short distance, fairly short distance, then you're going to get some of this uh, uh, turbulent uh, noise. Um, infrasound is the inaudible part of uh, uh, wind turbine noise caused by modulations or changes in intensity that occur because the way the, uh, the, uh, the rotors, the blades move in, with respect to the air and the tower. Uh, the worst problems come in the warm summer nights when the air is fairly stable in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, the biggest problem is when you have multiple turbines that are all creating their own series of uh, infrasound or modulations. Modulation, again, just means change. Um, and I, I think I, I pretty well, I'm pretty sure that uh, infrasound gives wind turbine noise a special uh, character, uh, unlike other sounds. That makes it difficult to compare, in a valid sort of way, wind turbine noise with other kinds of industrial noises. Or any, any kind of noise. Uh, start out with, uh, there's literature that says when a sound is unpredictable or people don't have any direct control of its uh, intensity, let's say, its creation, uh, it's more annoying uh, than if those things are not true. Uh, amplitude modulated sound like wind turbine sounds are more easily heard, perceived, and more annoying than constant level sounds. These are peer-reviewed studies, independent scientists. I don't know them. They're, most of them are from uh, uh, Germany, um, Sweden, and the Netherlands, I think. Wind turbine noise differ from other sources of community noise. That's been shown in many, many studies in terms of annoyance. This is a little hard to see, but I've modified this, just overlaid some uh, extra curves on a curve that was published in 2009. Uh, Pedersen and uh, colleagues uh, in a peer-reviewed journal, one of the most peer-reviewed journals in the country, um, shows that basically wind turbine noise is more annoying because, than other sounds, and the other sounds are those uh, listed at the top. By the way, shunting yards, does anybody know what shunting yards are? Mm -hmm. It's a British term that means rail yard, mm -hmm. and where the trains come in and converge and get coupled and decoupled and loaded and unloaded and there's a lot of noise. That's very disturbing noise. Uh, these other noises you can read. Uh, uh, wind turbine noise is uh, these little diamonds right here, right here, here, and here. And this is variation around them in terms of noise. The percent of people who are annoyed, uh, people are annoyed to wind turbines. Let's say 10% of people are annoyed at uh, very low levels, even below 40 decibels, 40 dBA. Okay. Um, airplanes takes a little more, around 45, and roads, uh, and uh, road traffic, and, and I believe it's railways, uh, about 50 dB. 20% uh, 20 20 of people are annoyed uh, at about between 40 and 45. You can take that to be roughly 42 or 43 decibels. Okay. Is, and one of the things we're talking about within the technical work, work group is uh, how many, the question of, a community has to ask itself, how many people are you willing to be annoyed if you do accept wind turbines that produce sounds of X decibels? I mean, that's a legitimate, I think, concern. And it's a question we think communities are going to have to solve. We can't solve it for you. Uh, I can't tell you that 10% uh, is a high number. It's not, maybe. Uh, I can tell you, though, that 20%, 25% gets you into lawsuit situations. That's what's happening around the country. So that's an issue that uh, we're going to have to face. Everybody is facing in the state who's working with these uh, issues. Uh, this was a study, a similar study. Actually, it's the same uh, study, same folks. Uh, the number of people annoyed, percentage of people annoyed, about 25-30% uh, of people are annoyed at 40 to 45 dB. You can read the numbers here, basically. I, you can't read them very well, I'm, I'm sure, but this is, uh, for example, 15 and 20 percent are very annoyed at 40 to 45. The numbers, of course, are less as you go down. Uh, but, but those relate, there's a dose-response relationship here, meaning that the higher the noise level, the more people are annoyed, generally. 
the two sets of curves, the dark and the shaded and the light bars, are Dutch, uh, uh, Dutch of the dark bars and the Swedish uh, folks are the uh, unshaded bars. A lot of these people were people who did not have a vested interest in wind turbines as well, but not all of them. Uh, I think about half of them. Um, I, I don't recall other details right now, and I don't want to take the time to, to do that. I, I do think you're going to hear tonight possibly uh, something about uh, the DBA and why it's a much better choice uh, for uh, to use in uh, discussing the intensity of noise from wind turbines. It is a standard. I agree, it's a standard. I think it's a very poor standard. Uh, these are what's called equal loudness curves. These were done many, many years ago in the 40s. Um, what they show is the level of sound intensity at different frequencies or pitches from low to high pitch that produce equal loudness in the human ear. So if you take uh, the 40, I'll take it as a reference because it is the reference for the DBA scale. Uh, it takes more intensity to listen to hear a, a low frequency sound at 40 decibels than it takes at other uh, uh, frequencies. That is, the ear is least sensitive. It takes more intensity just to hear it in the low pitches. It's, the ear is most sensitive in the uh, upper mid range of frequencies. It is least sensitive because it takes more intensity here in the low frequencies and it is inter intermediately sensitive in the high frequencies. So what the folks uh, decided to do is, is to say that, well, because uh, the ear really can't hear these sounds as well, they'll put a filter in there and not, not use them or not uh, look at them in the measurement. In other words, not account for them in the measurement and that will be the DBA scale. So the DBA scale is an inverse of the 40 dB, what's called Fon line. Uh, so if you turn that upside down, slightly different scale, you get a DBA scale. I've heard some people say recently that the C scale, and I don't know how much, have you guys dealt with C, C, C any scales at all? Mm -hmm. If you haven't, then I'm not going to bother with this. But you might hear here or elsewhere uh, tonight or some other time that the C scale is not a valid scale. The C scale is a very valid scale. It, it basically... Um, just tells us what sound pressure level uh, is present in the atmosphere on a sound level meter, which is, has nothing to do with the ear per se. It is true that the lower frequency group were less sensitive to lower frequencies, but uh, I've heard somebody say that the C scale uh, is invalid because it exaggerates the low frequencies. It's more apt to, more, uh, I think, valid to say that it, uh, the A scale is invalid because it de-emphasizes the low frequencies. And many of the low frequencies in, in, in uh, wind turbines, uh, many of the, the, much of the intensity or energy and noise of wind turbines is in the low frequencies. So that, those curves, and, and I know this is a bit technical, uh, you're applying an inverse of this scale up here to high levels. Notice these curves flatten out. So, we know that wind turbine energy is, is pretty high in these, in these low frequency areas. That's infrasound, particularly if you go below 20 hertz. This, uh, you go down to 1 hertz, and there is energy in wind turbines at 1 hertz. The A scale reduces at 148 decibels. So you just kind of knocked out 148 decibels uh, between uh, here and, and here, let's say, between 1,000 and uh, 1 hertz. In other words, DBA does not tell you what the ear is getting. It might tell you something about how the ear perceives sound, how, 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 how we respond to sound, but it does not tell us what is actually getting to the ear and perhaps even getting to the brain. Now, infrasound, by definition, we don't hear, but if we go loud enough, we will eventually hear it. Okay? So some of this sound that we call inaudible is, is audible to some ears, uh, and there are some effects I want to bring in here soon. Uh, some of that basic research I talked about to show it's conceivable that even though we don't hear it, it can do damage. It can do damage. Uh, the big issue with uh, wind turbines, and certainly the technical work group has decided sleep disturbance is really an issue that everybody, I think everybody, <coughs> the wind industry knows that uh, 
sleep uh, is bothered, we bothered in terms of uh, wake, uh, waking up and, and disturbed sleep in general, not sleeping as well uh, in the presence of noises. And this applies to wind turbine noise and other kinds. You all know this. Uh, the World Health Organization says that outside levels above 40 decibels dBA cause significant sleep disturbance and annoyance. And the higher the noise level, the higher the level of annoyance. Okay? Uh, some say that uh, annoyance is not related to health. Well, the World Health Organization, whose membership includes scientists from all over the world, these are renowned, famous, many of them famous, some are uh, Nobel Prize winners in science, uh, say that uh, there is a relationship because uh, both uh, sleep disturbance and um, annoyance can lead to increased stress, increased cardiovascular problems, and other health-related risk factors. I am not a physician. I'm not trying.